For nearly 80 years, the RAF has been at the forefront of defending Britain's interests at home and around the world. It has always been and remains one of the most capable and professional air forces in the world. Its mission is to deliver effective and affordable air power. Air power, the ability to deliver weapons from the air, was born in World War I. The military advantage to be gained by applying the speed, height and reach of aeroplanes was quickly appreciated and developed. By World War II, air power had come of age with aircraft that could fly faster and further with bigger payloads. RAF pilots flying hurricanes and spitfires turned the tide of the war when they defeated the enemy's bombers in the Battle of Britain. RAF bomber crews then carried the war deep into hostile territory, flying hundreds of miles to attack the enemy's war machine. All around the world, the RAF projected air power into every theater of war, making a vital contribution to victory. As the Cold War began, aircraft were also the means of unleashing the threat of nuclear war. A new and dangerous age was underway. With the advent of the jet engine, aircraft were soon flying faster than sound, carrying ever more devastating weapons and pushing back the limits of height, speed and reach. In the Falklands conflict, air power played a crucial role in deciding the outcome. The RAF contributed to three essential tasks, transporting ground forces, destroying enemy assets and maintaining air supremacy. But nowhere was the scale of modern air power demonstrated more dramatically than in the Gulf War. In August 1990, the armies of Iraq invaded and occupied Kuwait. It was the beginning of one of the most extraordinary military conflicts of modern times. Within 48 hours, the RAF and other Allied air forces were in the region. The speed of response probably stopped the invasion of Saudi Arabia. Then, in January 1991, the counter-attack began. The first step of the air campaign was to neutralize the Iraqi air force with attacks on airfields and radar units. Tornadoes flew round the clock, striking far into Iraq. These attacks were combined with raids by Jaguars on ground forces and installations. Precision strikes with laser-guided bombs were used to devastating effect. Before the ground campaign, and then during the fighting, air transport was used to deploy ground forces and equipment in the theater of war. Support helicopters helped keep up the momentum of the land attack by carrying men and equipment across the desert. Meanwhile, RAF fighters contributed to the Allied air defense of coalition forces. Air-to-air -air refueling before crossing the border enabled attack aircraft to penetrate deep into Iraq. While over the sea, Nimrods working closely with naval forces coordinated attacks on enemy ships. And throughout the campaign, RAF tornadoes flew continual recce missions in the hunt for Scud missile sites, the majority of which were destroyed. The effect of air power was overwhelming. It cleared the way so thoroughly that the Iraqi forces offered little resistance and the ground campaign was over in days. In Bosnia too, the RAF has played a prominent role, working together with our NATO partners to contain the war. Remarkably, this was the first time NATO had ever fought in anger. Hercules transports helped keep the lifeline open to Sarajevo. Meanwhile, RAF fighters and bombers helped to maintain air supremacy throughout the region. By attacking key ground installations, they were instrumental in forcing the removal of heavy weapons. Both conflicts, the Gulf and Bosnia, also demonstrate the value of projecting air power through clearly defined operational roles, of which the RAF has six. Air defense ensures the integrity of our airspace and contributes to the basic security of Britain. For this, the RAF has a network of ground radars which works in tandem with the E3D Sentry, or AWACS. Its radar can see well over the horizon, providing airborne early warning of any intruders. Together, they are the eyes and ears of the Royal Air Force. The teeth of Britain's air defence are the Tornado F3 fighters, which can be scrambled within minutes. 
They're armed with radar-guided and heat-seeking missiles. Any intruder that got past this first line of defense would be met by the RAF regiment's rapier missiles, which provide close-in defense for airfields. Offensive operations can paralyze an aggressor's military capability through selective attacks on strategic targets and by progressive destruction of his ground, air and naval forces. The mainstay of the RAF's offensive capacity is the multi-purpose Tornado GR-1. Its main task is long-range attack by day or night in all weathers. Variants of the GR-1 also carry out low-level reconnaissance and attacks against shipping. Among the tornado's weaponry is the alarm missile for the suppression of enemy air defenses. It is able to seek out and destroy radar installations, which is an essential step in achieving control of the air. Equally important is the neutralization of enemy airfields. This is the job of the JP-233 airfield denial weapon, which is designed to crater runways and taxiways and disrupt the enemy's operations. It proved highly successful in the early stages of the Gulf War. Another indispensable weapon is the laser-guided bomb, which is used for the selective destruction of key targets. The bomb is guided to its target from the attack aircraft or another aircraft in the vicinity. This means it can be delivered with pinpoint accuracy. The tornado is complemented by the Jaguar, also capable of ground attack and reconnaissance. Then there is the Harrier GR-7, with its unique short takeoff and landing ability. It provides close support to frontline ground forces, but also has a long-range capability, making it one of the RAF's most versatile aircraft. Whatever task an aircraft has to perform, air-to-air -air refueling adds an extra dimension. Air-to-air -air refueling enables attack aircraft to fly further into enemy territory and fighters to stay on patrol longer. It also allows the RAF to travel quickly to distant trouble spots. In effect, it multiplies the available force. As a seafaring nation, it is vital that we maintain the integrity of our territorial waters and those around our dependencies. The RAF uses the Nimrod maritime patrol aircraft to monitor the sea lanes around the British Isles and elsewhere. With its powerful radar and sophisticated electronics, the Nimrod can seek out submarines and ships at long range. If necessary, it can call in the maritime version of the Tornado. This carries the Sea Eagle missile, which skims at wave height to the target. The Nimrod can also carry out and coordinate search and rescue operations. Rescue operations often involve the RAF Sea King helicopters. Over the years, the all-weather Sea King has proved a welcome sight for many in trouble, both at sea and on land. But the main role of helicopters is to support the army in short-range transport and the movement of troops and equipment. The mighty Chinook is the backbone of this task. Most of these dedicated support helicopters work constantly as an integral component of the rapid reaction forces within NATO. The Chinook is complemented by the Puma. In a land operation, this kind of air power is crucial in gaining the initiative and securing vital positions. To transport men and equipment over long distances is the job of the air transport fleet. The workhorse of this role is the Hercules not only for military operations, but also for humanitarian relief missions. The VC-10 serves this role too, as does the much larger TriStar. In fulfilling Britain's defence policy, the RAF must be ready at all times to fulfil any of its operational roles. To do so, it relies on the ability and commitment of its people. It is easy to think of the RAF in terms of pilots and aircrew, but this is to miss the point. To keep one flyer in the air requires literally dozens of people on the ground, each with their own important contribution. The standards which they achieve are the means by which the operation in the air is made as effective and safe as possible. The key is training. Whatever their jobs, Personnel develop their abilities continuously throughout their careers to a standard that puts the RAF among the two or three most effective and professional air forces in the world. 
Training covers the widest range of technologies and leadership skills. And it makes RAF people highly sought after as employees when they leave to pursue new careers as civilians. From the public's point of view, the most visible type of training is low flying. The RAF is keenly aware that it causes disturbance, so it's kept to an absolute minimum. But why is low flying so important? In a conflict, attack aircraft would have to penetrate sophisticated radar and anti-aircraft defenses. They would be vulnerable to enemy fighters and missiles. Their best chance of survival would lie in flying very fast and low, using the ground contours to screen them from the enemy and delay detection. Our air crews use these techniques to reach their targets and return without being detected. They apply the skills learned through progressive training and continuous practice in peacetime. Because low flying is so demanding, it cannot be learned quickly in an emergency. Nighttime low flying in particular takes many hours of hard training, which includes learning the use of night vision goggles. Helicopters too are frequently required to fly at low level, and this requires a completely different set of skills. Then there are the transport aircraft. In a relief operation, they may have to fly in low to deliver aid, facing the risk of attack from the ground. So it's only through regular peacetime practice that our air crews can acquire and retain the proficiency they would need to cope with the additional pressures of operational flying. The RAF will always be as sensitive as it can to the needs of people affected by low-level flying. But the unavoidable truth is that low flying, whether by combat aircraft or for humanitarian needs, is a skill that we cannot afford to compromise. Today, as much as at any time in its history, the RAF can rely on world-class aircraft, equipment and people. It is adapting to change while ensuring that its underlying traditions and ethos are retained. Its watchword is affordable power projection. Above all, it is prepared. Because if history teaches us one thing, it is to be fully prepared for the unexpected. Nothing less than this is required to maintain the security Britain expects. The Royal Air Force is prepared. It is our insurance policy for the future. The Royal Air Force, affordable power projection.